So welcome, uh, we are continuing our course on computational GAB analysis and I thought it's a good moment to recover or recall a few things um, that I'm using all the time which are not standard MATLAB. So um, as so far I'm working with signal length 480 because it has nice a nice number of divisors therefore a lot of subgroups can be displayed um, and it's big enough to look like a continuous function and it's small enough to be quick and fast. Now the Gauss function, if I would plot it, the discrete Gauss function, if I would plot it in the ordinary way wouldn't look properly, but if I would um, use it such that the plot is nice and apply the FFT it wouldn't be nice either. So you have to think that this is a discretized sampled version of the Gauss function with 480 samples and uh, therefore it's stretching uh, from, uh, well, let's say, uh, of, uh, I'm running this section once more. It's stretching from minus 10 to plus 10. So you see these labels that you see here are the labels of a Gauss function of length 120 labeled by the number of the pixel or of the sample. Whereas uh, in reality, I should probably plot it uh, in the sense of a real value. If you say, well, this is not a discrete Gauss function, which is coming somewhere from the discrete world, but these are samples of a continuous functions, then you would say, no, I'm having a period which is square root of 480, so roughly 22. Uh, therefore, it would be plotted from minus 11 to plus 11, if it was the Gauss function of this size at a sampling rate of 1 over square root of 480. So that's of course altogether giving 480 samples. Actually even my plot is doing 481 samples because the left and the right boundary um, should look symmetric and they are identically so one value is plotted twice in this routine. That's also true here. Now uh, another thing that you have seen many times is that based on this centered plotting routine I uh, usually uh, display or compare two functions by doing the using the command f2 spec which just, just means well I'm looking at two functions and their spectra so they're Fourier transforms so I'm choosing a signal which is a random signal in the true sense uh, random complex normalized, that means it has norm 1 in the Euclidean sense, and a low pass signal also normalized, but that's just convenient. And here uh, the low signal command uh, can be done in one and two dimensions, uh, is choosing a signal of length n with maximal frequency 20. So it's a trigonometric polynomial in, in, in reality. And this trigonometric polynomial has uh, 41 uh, random coefficients which are normalized such that you see this is a complex valued function with blue real part imaginary part and uh, here you see the restriction. Now I have also discussed already the Shannon sampling theorem and here I'm using the name SHA for a Dirac comb so it's the command to get this is very easy. You take a zeros of lengths n and then you put it positions 8, jump 8, no, position 1, jump 8 up to n. You put a 1 and then you multiply your original signal with this SHA distribution. So what you see here is somehow uh, you see the large amplitudes, maybe I should say from the original signal, give you these here, the large imaginary parts you see here. But the effect on this multiplication with the Dirac comb is the same as doing a Fourier transform, which is the spectrogram, um, convolved with the Fourier transform of the of the SHA. And we see here clearly that if you're sampling Dirac comb according to Poisson's formula more or less, is having a distance of eight, then you have eight copies well distributed. So it means at distance 60. So the center of the spectrogram is at 0, 60, 120, or of course in MATLAB coordinates it would be 161 and so on. And everybody can see from this picture, you just have to cut out the middle part to recover it by multiplying it with some function which is constant 1 here 
and zero at all the other copies. So depending on the bandwidth and the sampling rate, you have some or a lot of freedom, but this is a good example where you have enough freedom to multiply here with a smooth function. And that smooth function uh, recovers this and does a reconstruction. So here it's just uh, once more the original signal, but I could demonstrate that the Shannon demo theorem works fine. Now, uh, if I do uh, now the, uh, the, the if I display functions, uh, I have another way of looking at these functions. So a function can be an image, but it, in most cases it's considered to be an operator. So if you're asking me what is the norm of the function or what is the uh, Frobenius norm of this, then of course uh, you will get uh, uh, the norm of this function, uh, this vector in the Euclidean space, or you can say I'm interested in, well, in the square root, that's the Hilbert-Schmidt definition of this matrix multiplied with the transpose conjugate. And in all the cases, you should see that the result is um, something and it's always one except for the norm and why because the norm of a random matrix because it has so many cancellations and terms will be much smaller and of course if i run it once more what you see here they are always normalized uh, well it's interesting to see that uh, the operator norm seems to be uh, maybe i'm running it yeah it, it, you see it changes a little bit but I'm surprised that they are always so similar. Now, what you see from this picture is also quite clear that for random matrices, all for representation, whether you take the matrix or you take it as a Fourier transform, which is more or less the two dimensional Fourier transform. So this is like your random vector and the Fourier transform will be random. It's a change of basis. So randomness, if it's done properly, we shouldn't change very much. But um, uh, but we can uh, look at the Cornelberg symbol, everything will be the same. Now, uh, maybe I do in between for you a new uh, section and I say, well, what if uh, the Y or the set set is a low pass signal uh, of size maybe N and uh, 2N or with maximal frequency 4 and 12. And then I'm doing a display. Then uh, we are creating, uh, that's not good, it should be a new figure. So then you should see, uh, oh, that's a typo. You should see a rectangular uh, object and that's, that's true here and this rectangular object has some smoothness so the, there is you would say that it is a, the, you see here a trigonometric polynomial of two variables which in one direction that's the smaller direction um, is i think that that was the rule because i'm thinking of a matrix and then the matrices description are in terms of a three by five matrix tells you the height and the width. So um, that probably is the frequency in the vertical direction. So you would say the Y component in polynomials goes from Y to the minus fourth to the plus four. So you have nine frequencies in that direction and you have 12 maximal frequency, which means 25. So altogether, this is composed randomly from uh, nine times 25 uh, random coefficients and if i repeat this you will see another picture and you'll see another picture and it's important to see that you should never in such experiments just take the ordinary random number generator because then you would only test for positive things and just to tell, show you what happens if i increase the frequency in the vertical direction then you will see there are more oscillations in that directions in that direction or in the other form maybe i take six here and uh 32 
then you see there is more waviness in, in the horizontal direction. So this is just demonstrating more or less for the pictures. But uh, maybe another thing that you should you, that you, you have seen is that if I look uh, at the x axis a random signal and I look at the short time Fourier transform, yeah, so image STF is just uh, take the signal and take the standard Gaussian for this and uh, you can choose another window if you want so again i should start a new figure then uh, it has a behavior which is very very similar i mean at first sight uh, compared to the such a band limited function and that was actually very much motivating our work yeah we could also take uh, uh, the uh, image tf of uh, low signal of n and 100 so that's a bit big bigger uh, then of course uh, the high frequencies are not present and it's on a time strip up to frequency 100 maybe you see here more if i do a plot uh, I, if i plot the axis i mean plot x but you also see, you could see if you would do some uh, some uh, determination that the boundaries are a bit smooth, so it's not exactly stopping. So the support is is not uh, not exactly the same. You can, uh, yeah. Now, since I have been asked uh, to talk about or to mention the fractional free transform, at the moment I will just do it by by. Uh, uh, picture, so to say. So I'm using uh, something which I use ma many times, the Hermit function command. So the Hermit function command creates a family of Hermit functions. Okay, sorry, it should be. And uh, once I have this, uh, and okay, it didn't give a name here. Okay, so maybe I should give this a name. So set is low signal and and maybe I take 80 only low signal now it's going to be oops set set we see something quite similar and now I'm taking this and to make a new figure and I'm showing you image STF of Hermrod. That's kind of rotation in the time frequency plane with the help of the Hermit function. And it will be the set set, uh, let's say by 25 degrees and using the Hermit functions, which I don't have to compute uh, once more. Um, so let's see what happens here. And you see it's rotating the picture you can compare it you can say well there was the feature here quite interesting and where do you find it here it's here and of course uh, such a rotation in, a, in starting from a square image has a problem with things which are happening at the, outside the inner circle so i would say uh, what you have to look for maybe also another picture is what is the yeah maybe comp norm is another routine i'm using most of the time the first this well i'm using the hermit system as a collection of row vectors um and now let me look at image stf of uh, function number 150 or so or 50 yeah. so then uh, we have two observations namely uh, the the uh, gauss function is hermit function number zero and hermit function number 150 is uh, is this one so maybe i'm increasing it now with 250 and uh well we can uh, do another figure 
to estimate where we touch the boundary image stf permit function number 320 and of course you can say well uh yeah this is probably very close to the limit uh, that you would accept so every image or every spectrogram which is sitting inside of this here um, and we remember that 320 is two thirds of, of, of the signal length. And this ratio between maximal number of Hermit functions, which are reliable. Uh, but of course, I should show you also uh, another figure uh, that uh, the Hermit function system, yeah, maybe two things. The Hermit functions, as I compute them, whatever they are, uh, have the property uh, that. Uh, they are forming an autonomous basis so there's an n by n system of row vectors and uh, so this uh, that was a bit unnecessary the computation shows me that all the color products of this system which is the gram matrix of our system is exactly the identity matrix so they are really normalized they're an autonomous basis uh yeah and of course uh, you would like to see them so let me look at i don't know hermit function number five, four and hermit function number uh, 11. and you see how how useful these commands are for comparison and what you see here number four is uh, looks very nice it seems to be invariant under the free transform and in reality you can do this for any number which is zero modulo four so we all know the gauss function is fully invariant and you think that well not too many functions are fully invariant or so uh, but uh, every linear combination of hermit functions with numbers zero four eight and so on are fully invariant now here, number 11 is, uh, looks as if it was um, uh, um, exactly the inverse of the minus. So maybe uh, I do, because we are already discussing Hermit functions now, F to spec Hermit function number five. And so let, let's see, uh, 11 is, modulo three so if we have zero and uh, and uh, 11 modulo three we have one and two so i should look at h number five and six or six maybe 46 so that you get an idea of higher order uh, and maybe 25 let's see if that is working no, there was a, yeah, have to, uh, no, sorry, the bracket is, this first bracket is missing. Uh, yeah, number 25, 25, and so, okay. So what you see here is the Hermit function themselves, they're real valued functions. Uh, and also these higher order Hermit functions are real valued. And uh, here, clearly you go to minus i times this. And here probably I was uh, a bit lazy. I, I don't know. But the eigenvalues of the Hermit functions are eigenvalues of the free transform. And therefore, uh, they will go to the, I see that that, that was, the 25 was wrong. Uh, 26 maybe and then i'm stopping playing around so depending on the number yeah here you see they are a minus i times the function itself so it's going from real value to complex value and uh, also this seems to be this so maybe i should choose another number now uh, but uh, yeah maybe i'm just going with 47 i was changing the wrong one then it should be i don't know <laughs> Okay, so so let let's leave it here. Uh, now, uh, what you can say, or maybe what I can uh, tell you or demonstrate directly, also is if it if I take a random signal 
uh, which I don't know has 10, uh, yeah, 10 coefficients and I multiply it with uh, linear combinations of, uh, I'm starting with Hermit function number zero and I'm taking every force element up to, um, now I have to think a little bit, I would say 39. Uh, yeah, okay, it's, well, it still doesn't work. But then I would like to see if this is a Fourier invariant guy. And of course, I have to take the unitary version of the Fourier transform. So let's first check this out. Yeah, uh, oh, it, it was a type of 3, 9. Yeah, so of course, uh, you can get a quite wild, uh, wild function, and uh, but it's a linear combination of such functions. But you only choose numbers zero, four, eight, and all of them are invariant on the full transform. Okay, now the next thing I wanted to explain a little bit better is these four main representation of a matrix. Um, I mean, we all know that you have a linear operator, and you can store the information about the linear operator by looking at the matrix which is you represent the pictures of the unit vectors in the basis so this is for a convolution matrix the picture that you get so i was taking a random convolution operator or actually a low pass a smooth low pass and the convolution matrix is clearly has a nice stripe pattern and if you look closer you find that the dark blue area in this case is continued so a cyclic matrix means that this side diagonal combined with this would be this so yeah you i could represent it in a side diagonal form maybe uh that's something i should do here uh, in addition so uh image image uh yeah maybe i can do it no, no, I should do it now in standard representation. The absolute value of the side stigma of uh, the matrix, which was called convolution matrix coming from Y. And then you will see, you see uh, probably one has to be careful with the uh, uh, assignment with the colors or so. I don't know why it's red here or so, because it should be the same, but probably it's a uh, different scaling so well but the point is in the side diagonal format where the first row is exactly the the diagonal of the original matrix and so on you have constant in this format now the other one the second format is the same matrix in the in the, in the matrix in the, the matrix representation in the Fourier picture so you are starting from the Fourier coefficients of a, of a simple input signal and the output is also the same thing and we have seen or we know that convolution is just multiplication so it's uh, multiplication of course is a diagonal matrix so if you're just doing what i'm doing i call this show mat command which means show me the matrix in four different realizations then i don't see anything because it's so faint and weak so that i had to zoom in and only after zooming in, you see there is a small stripe. And why is it so small? Well, because this original y, y was a band limited function. So you're multiplying with non zero entries only from zero to the maximal frequency, which was uh, occurring in our signal. Now, uh, the spreading representation is uh, more or less doing the side digmat format of the diagonal representation. So it says, well, I can compose every matrix from n squared time frequency shift matrices. If we know how much we need, we just uh, describe it and put the coefficient of this time frequency picture in the in this such a matrix. Again, the plot is with zero in the middle. The data structure is a standard format with a matrix. Now, when you have a pure a convolution operator, then it's a linear combinations of constant side diagonals and we have seen that the constant side diagonal is just the matrix representation of a pure shift so every convolution operator 
is just a linear combination of shift operators and here you see how many shifts you need. Now uh, this thing has a spreading represent has a, a symplectic Fourier transform which is in, important in other cases and that's the so-called Cohn-Nierenberg symbol. It's also known as the time variant transfer function. So somehow the idea is well a convolution operator can be described by the impulse response which would be the generating first column of this matrix. So the in answer to this and the rest is just taking this first column and shifting it around and actually uh, that's why the flip in the convolution comes in because uh, here we would say it's a moving average and you would take the first row of the moving average and then the, but this is uh, the flipped version gives you the column but this is just simple okay so the cohn nierenberg symbol has a strip pattern in this particular case because we were starting with the convolution operator with this so you see not certain high frequencies are um, involved in this time variant um, um, transfer function. So some of the idea is um, at every place I uh, having the output of a convolution operator, but here I'm seeing better how the convolution kernels are changing from position to position. So it's a slowly varying convolution operator, so to say. Okay, now, uh, uh, if I take now, in order to demonstrate also the usefulness of this viewpoint, in the case of Gabor frames, I could create a Gabor family with lattice constants A and B, or I have already the direct command, give me the Gabor frame matrix uh, for the random uh, window. This is just to illustrate things so that things are not degenerate or, or faint or, or harmless with lattice constants A and B. And if I look at this, uh, uh, these representations, it's not, very, it's not very much to see. I mean, the point is this is a, a representation where everything is plotted, which is non-zero or so, but it, uh, especially the Kornierberg symbol, I don't know how to read it. Here I see in a very faint point in the midpoint, and even after zooming in, I see only very little contributions. So it's much better to do a spy command. And here, once more, I would say number one, that's the matrix representation, and number three, the spreading representation, they are relevant for the properties of the Gabor frame operator. So you may recall that the uh, general frame business of so finding the minimal normally square representation from a system of vectors may need the inversion of some matrix or even the pseudo inverse of some matrix or so, but we will see there's a lot of structure. And uh, in terms of patterns of these representations, you see this is on a stripe and I've chosen thick stripes to make it well visible, but uh, the stripes are, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, my A and my B are, well, A and B are, are uh, the, the usual values with 16 and 20. So uh, uh, you can start counting now how many side diagonals you have. So you should say the, uh, this one and this one and this one, and then I guess you will see that there are exactly B side diagonals. And then you can say, well, well, maybe we give it a name. Uh, yeah, uh, let's give it a name. Uh, uh, let's look at the, in the main diagonal. Uh, do another figure. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, I'm doing side diagonal of the frame operator is side digmat of sx and so now let's do a plot uh, command applied to this first row which uh, yeah let's just do it directly which would be the diagonal the main diagonal if i do not do anything of of this here and i'm not sure if we can see enough in this picture oh yeah it's quite clear uh, this is clearly a periodic thing and of course you can start counting this and it turns out to be the period is uh, is uh, 20 which is the a 
and therefore we have n divided by a which is 24 uh, 24 which is n divided by a repetitions and this is something that you have also here in the other side diagonals so maybe i take this side diagonal form and if i claim that they're they are at a distance and that there are 20 of them then means the number one is okay and then n by 20 is uh well uh, n by uh, sorry n by b sorry i have b side diagonals what was my claim so i have n divided by b which is 30 so i'm i'm trying to see if i'm right or if i did some miscalculations in my head so i'm saying let's do a plot of the side diagonal of in the now in this in the full format i don't have to glue together uh, matching parts and it should be number 31 yeah, also a new figure and you see i mean now i'm able to present such things i will see it's again it's periodic it's a complex valued function actually it's also interesting the main diagonal is a real valued function and i could uh, you could look at the norm of the uh, row norms that's another thing we can do plot uh, the row norms of the sds xx or, sorry. or maybe i do a stem and again a new figure what what has to be or should be demonstrated is that uh yeah the norm of the main diagonals of the main diagonal is the biggest and actually uh it's a uh, convolution of uh, it's a periodization of the window absolute squared and if you have a random complex valued window it's plausible that by taking the absolute square uh, and periodizing it you get something big whereas here you have shifted versions of the window and complex conjugates so what happened here with the complex valued for number um, 31 is is uh, quite good and just to show you we could take number 61 just to convince yourself all of them are very tiny but the one which are modulo n over b uh, starting from one are the interesting ones now uh the other thing which is quite interesting oh sorry no i have to go back here is uh if i look at this here so in the matrix representation looking at the matrices as if they were images you don't see much but if you're taking the spreading function and here i'm avoiding that some spurious uh, contributions are are displayed so i'm saying take this the spreading function now the spreading function might be or will be in the in such a random situation will be complex valued therefore i make it positive and then i take everything which is not harmless not less than 1000 times the numerical precision and what you see here is for this random it's sitting it's sitting on a lattice now of course you can play around and can ask well what is what looks this lattice like and it turns out to be the same as the joint lattice of our original lattice so uh, my claim is that what we have here i will discuss this in a second with 320 points is uh, exactly what we have here so the same parameters we could test it also but let's let's uh, first go this so what is important for GABA analysis well we are dealing with lattices and we move our window along a lattice in this case to the left the original lattice horizontal distance a equal 20 vertical distance equal 16 and uh so altogether we have 320 lattice points so as we know redundancy is 3 over 2 and the joint lattice that's the set of all point sets which are uh, uh yeah kind of um, I, would, uh, I don't have to repeat it which commute with the original ones uh, which is exactly the lattice with the lattice constants n over b n over a so we have one, uh, 30 in the vertical direction uh, sorry 30 in n over b in the horizontal direction which is 30 
and n over a, which is 24 in the, in the horizontal direction, and the, the vertical direction. So, but the point is the redundancy is now two third. So now uh, it's possible to look at Gaussians sitting here. They are not occupying so much space. And the very interesting matter that we have already discussed is that uh, whenever you have a lattice and whenever you have verified that the Gauss or any, any window is giving you a frame with this lattice, then uh, you know two things that this dual lattice plays two important roles. The Garber system with respect to this uh, adjoint lattice, and sometimes I call it the adjoint, uh, lattice, uh, the adjoint Garber system, will be a Ries basic sequence. So it will be a linear independent set. In the finite dimensional setting, this is what you have. But you can look at the condition number, or you can look at the, let's say, at the condition number of the Gram matrix, which tells you how well how close it is to an autonomous system. And uh, well, it turns out to be the case that this is the same as the condition number of the frame operator here. Now, uh, what is the optimal frame for this here? Well, when your window is not just the original Gauss function, but the tight window, which you can get. And what does it mean here? That you have an orthonormal basis here. And I have told you already, what, in my opinion, is the best way to do orthogonalization. Don't use Gram-Schmidt. I mean, after all, here you would have to choose some order. Should you start in the middle and go around, or should you choose first row, second row, and so on? It would be never a Gabber system applying Gram-Schmidt. But if you do the lift in orthogonalization, which you can describe of doing your system uh, and apply the gram to the minus one half. This gives you a 320 by 320 matrix. So you have 300 column or row vectors, it's symmetric. And those can be used to recombine those 320 Gabor elements to build a new system, which turns out to be also a Gabor element and which is then a tight Gabor element. So we have two ways of doing it, of, of improving our situation. From the lattice, we can choose the square root inverse of the Gabor, or square root inverse of the Gabor frame operator, or we can choose uh, this system and take it for the Gram matrix. So in each case, starting from a window, we get a better window. And this is a tight Gabor window here and an autonomous basis for a linear span here. We don't change the spaces in both cases. But the great thing is, condition number of the frame operator is the same as the condition number of the Gram matrix. The dual element here generating the dual frame or the biotogonal generator uh, for the adjoint Gabor systems, this is always the same and the same is true for the tightness. So not only the quality goes over, but the procedure to get the tight guy here is, is the same. Now, uh, again, this comparison, so this is a command I'm saying, compare uh, patterns, let's say. Uh, and, uh, and now if I do a slanted version, S stands for slanted or sheared version, so I'm applying the side stigmat command, which we had already, to the lattice. This doesn't change the number of points. And then, of course, I can do two things, basically. I can compute the joint lattice, or I can ask what are now the yeah, I mean, the cytigmat is an automorphism, so it preserves the group. So vector addition under this operation is preserved. And that's why you get from a discrete subgroup or a discrete subgroup, and it's compatible in a covariant way with the operations. So you see the same operation applied to these two lattices is this here. Also, the general, the story here was I was choosing a cytigmat to, to change this lattice, and then I was uh, doing the abstract definition of the commuting lattice, which is the joint lattice. and But you see, it's it's exactly this here. Now, uh, I don't go back to the Janssen representation, but the Janssen representation essentially tells us, and also the formulas tells us that uh, the, uh, the Gabor frame operator can be represented as not only as a linear combination of those time frequency shifts for only from a family of 320, but that the amplitudes come 
from the spreading function of a projection operator. So maybe that, that's maybe I will continue later uh, with this slides, but let me just uh, do something uh, at the end of this part. If you take the projection operator, recall I'm doing row multiplication. So if you hit uh, a scalar product for me is taking a scalar product with the row vector from the right means g prime is transpose conjugate and then i do synthesis with the g so that's why the projection operator is the n by n symmetric matrix which is created by g prime with g and of course uh, in my case uh, uh, i have uh, a normalized version of this so just for fun let me uh, verify uh, that uh, this is really an orthogonal projection. Uh, but the point was uh, to demonstrate that uh, the display with the matrix as it is, it's kind of the natural form, almost uh, avoids, uh, we almost cannot see the, the matrix because the Gauss function has this peak in the middle. Therefore, I'm using the image C command and I'm apply strong zoom and a plot ax to show you, well, it's, this is how you would think of a 2D Gaussian. And now uh, the interesting thing is, what can you say about the, the four representations of a, a projection operator in the case of a Gaussian? Uh, and uh, what you see here is uh, that it is um, looks like a Gaussian and it's true it's just a 2D Gaussian this is just a matrix this is our PGG and that's a 2D Gaussian because we have this exponential law also with respect to x and y variables so e to the minus absolute x squared is the same as minus x squared plus y squared in terms of coordinates first and second coordinates now if we take the Fourier version we have to take the two-dimensional Fourier transform. But two-dimensional Fourier transform of a tensor means you apply it individually. So we have the vertical Gauss and the horizontal Gauss, and both of them go to themselves. So this is why this is not only in terms of absolute values, and one has to be careful for the rest. Uh, they are. I'm not showing you the real imaginary part, but only the absolute value. That's also quite important. But it, it shows that it's very well concentrated. Now the Kohn-Nierenberg symbol is uh, is uh, something that uh, is having the same absolute value, so it's really like a Gauss function. And this now, uh, and that must, it looks very mysterious to you. I mean, this is supposed to be the symplectic Fourier transform. And what is the symplectic Fourier transform? Well, it's a once in one direction, it's a forward Fourier transform. In the second, it's a uh, inverse Fourier transform and plus a transposition. Now, in our case, everything is symmetric, so it should be a 2D Fourier transform, but no, it looks broader. Actually, if you take a, uh, the square of this, so then it's shrinking and it's having exactly this form. So the shape of this, the envelope, the absolute value of this here is a square root of this here. But uh, how can this be? And the answer is, well, here you have uh, a symplectic Fourier transform, but this here is not a Gauss function, but it's a Gauss function multiplied with the Fourier matrix. So maybe I will, this is part of the collection, I will maybe show it to you. So it's a strange thing. You take this 2D Gauss function and multiply it with a 2D, with a 2D image, which is the Fourier transform of this. And then you take a symplectic Fourier transform, which still is more or less a 2D Fourier transform, and you get this. That's how these two things are happening. Now, uh, one understanding of, of this here, the spreading representation of a rank one operator. So clearly we've seen we're doing analysis with G and synthesis with G is that this is always, at least in absolute terms, the short time Fourier transform of this. And that's what we have seen here. This is the short time Fourier transform. Um, no, no, it's, it, this is the, the plot, but I could, uh, we could compare it with the short time Fourier transform. Yeah, maybe I'm doing this. Comp image C, STFT of G and G. 
and the match to spread of PGG. I should not recompute re re it again. And uh, let's see. And it will be very much, it will be too concentrated. So I'm doing the command do all. So each of the two pictures, I'm doing a plot. And so uh, at least this should make plausible. Hmm. Well, it's, too, it's just too slow. Maybe I. Uh, maybe I should start a new figure. Uh, but uh, essentially, I mean, we can also compare the absolute values. Maybe that's that would be okay. Ah, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I see. There's no bracket. Uh, that's. Uh, I didn't see the error message. Yeah, here, here you see. So this is uh, seems to be convincing. And of course I can uh, uh, do now a numerical comparison, but of the absolute value. So you see how I'm working. Compare the absolute value of the short-term free transform, the absolute value of this here. And then that should give you something which is uh, satisfactory. And you see, it, you know, yeah, so, so it's, it's the error is, is small. And uh, what I don't see here, why, why the picture has re been removed. Yeah, okay. So uh, I think uh, this is uh, mostly what I wanted to tell you. And now, uh, before closing this window, I would like to show you something slightly different and it's about this pi pi star. So I was just doing it shortly before the course and hopefully it's, it's not, it's not uh, disturbing you too much, but um, uh, I, do, I was doing here a very cheap, very uh, um, uh, primitive uh, um, realization and uh, uh, actually, I'm doing it in the following sense. We know that if you give me um, the parameters, so FRS is now frequency, oh, sorry, it should be time shift, time shift and frequency shift. I can build the matrix, which is realizing the time frequency shift. So more or less, as you know, it will be a side diagonal matrix at distance TMS from this, so three in the test case or so. And a frequency shift which means that there's a pure frequency sitting on the side diagonal. Uh, okay, so uh, now conjugating clearly means you're multiplying with the inverse, but we have a unitary matrix from the left. So it's multiplying from the left with the inverse and from the right. Now, actually I was a bit, bit lazy or didn't check so far, but I can do it now. Whether this is the right way, maybe I should do it from uh, in the opposite order with the with the inverse on the on the other side or so. Now uh, I want to demonstrate this here, so I'm doing now. Uh, uh, where where is my MATLAB here? Yeah, I go back to the demo file or so. Um, section new uh, frequency shift like three and. Uh, or yeah, whatever, five and uh, time shift equals three, something quite small. And then, uh, yeah, the show, maybe I just say, well, I want to see, get some extra command, which I've prepared. And uh, so what I'm doing here is the following. I take a random matrix. And that random matrix um, is that random matrix is conjugated with the time frequency shift that I have here. And the claim is, and now I'm just copying this command, hopefully no, it doesn't work. Maybe I go to the original one. Uh, I want to verify that what it means is I'm doing a shift in the Cornier picture. So uh, 
Hopefully, not really tested it, but we'll see. Yeah, it works fine. Yeah. So, uh, what what does it mean? So, I'm I'm trying to read this now. So, we can do two things. You tell me what is your time shift and what is your frequency shift, and I'm applying this fancy representation. Uh, why is it? What does it mean? Is a representation? If you give me another time frequency shift, and you you combine it once more, then of course it's compatible with this yeah maybe uh we can we can test it here so we can take uh, frequency shift two is seven uh time shift two is 12 whatever it is and now i'm saying well, let's do the comp norm of a uh, pi pi star of the already shifted version uh of which is txxt and now with the new one, which is time shift two, frequency shift two. And we compare it with pi pi star to the original X. And now I have to add, we had time shift three plus 12 is 15. And then we have frequency shift five first, and then seven, which is also 12, no, which is 12, yeah. And if I do this, uh, we have a kind of, verified in, a, in an informal way we are confident that this pi pi star applied to a, a random matrix and some randomly chosen shift parameters is really uh, behaving in an additive way so first you are doing it with uh, three and five and then with uh, 12 and seven and together you get exactly the sum so this is an indication that you have a representation and now that this is more interesting what is the effect at the Cohn Nirnberg level? So you're having a Cohn Nirnberg symbol of some modified operator. So how does it compare to the Cohn Nirnberg symbol, which is the MAT to KNS of the original one? And the answer is, well, it's just shifting. Now, shifting in 2D means I have to move around in a by cyclic rotation, both row wise and column wise. Uh, of a matrix and so uh, we have to find out what we do first and then we have some conventions do we describe the rotation uh, of columns or do we say we are rotating uh, rows or so and what is horizontal what is vertical and I found it natural to say rotate rows and columns and describe the rotation in the vertical direction by now with the frequency parameter because we have frequency always in the short term free transform always plotted up and down and time shift horizontal left and right and you see here that's the verification that this is exactly true and it's it's uh, compatible so what i would like to do now is to say well what if i uh, take uh, the g35 is uh, the rot mode of g with three and five so keep in mind i have my time shift three and frequency shift five and uh yeah just to recall what it means on the original function looking at the situation in the two uh in the, in the standard case you have gauss function you're having free transform invariant. You're shifting a little bit here uh, and you get a modulation. And in this case, three and five are not so different. Maybe I should take, uh, I don't know, 15 uh, to, to show you more. Then of course the modulation parameter would be high and also the shift parameter would be more visible in this case. But the small shift parameter on the time side gives a low frequency multiplication on the frequency side or so okay so let's keep this in mind 3 and 15 and now i'm saying well i can project pg uh, 35 yeah i should call it 315 now actually um which is project on g uh, uh that's the nonsense it's 315 yeah uh three yeah here it's 315 uh so it's 315 prime no sorry 
fifteen prime with G three fifteen. And now what I claim is that this is the same. So I'm saying P G three fifteen, the projection operator on one of the Gabor atoms, which are located at another place here at the corresponding to the place 315 is exactly the pi pi star of the projection, but moved by 3 and 15. Now I have not tested it, but we will see whether or that it's okay. Yes, and I'm glad to see it's okay. So uh, my usual way of, of uh, Describing this is the following. Yeah, maybe now I should show you show mod uh, PG315. I'll leave the upper plots uh, intact. So, uh, figure and show mod. Uh, so, essentially, what I wanted to demonstrate here is that uh, oh, there is something wrong. Oh, yeah, show mat is wrong, it's show mat four. Um, what I'm demonstrating here is that instead of, yeah, again, we have to do a do all zoom five, do all plot x. So uh, everything looks quite, quite similar. Uh, you can look at the position of this. Uh, hopefully it comes up soon. Uh, but the point is that this Kornirnberg symbol, which is a... Hmm, I don't think it's doing the right thing. But if you would look closer, if we wait a little while, and then you will see that here everything... This is moved. Yeah, okay, here, that's very good, yeah. So zoomed in, you see there is some shift parameter in the in the spreading part, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Fourier part or so, but uh, less significant in the time part. Yeah, so maybe that's, that's quite interesting. We had a small time shift. So here, this operator is moving along the main diagonal by 3.3. Three. I think it's a good uh, example. In the frequency domain, you see there's a shift by 15, which is plausible. In the spreading domain, you would see phase factors change, so that would be the same as the original one. But in the Kornirnberg symbol, it's exactly the right thing. So you we have we had a time shift of three and a frequency shift of 15. So it's going in a coherent way. And now what I wanted to explain at the end is uh, if you're having this uh, Kuhn Nuremberg symbol, um, it, yeah, sorry, if you're projecting on a Gabor atom at a different place, you have two different ways. You can say, well, I'm cutting out the information in the signal at the position of my atom. Or you can say, no, first I move my signal from the area of interest where my Gabor atom is located to the center where I put the ordinary projection operator, and then I move the result backwards. So this is a, essentially a one-line proof that the that the Gabor um, atom is doing this. So since the time is already quite uh, um, quite um, advanced, I, I don't want to start a new presentation. Or so instead, maybe I recall to you uh, what the tight Gabor window is. Uh, we have computed it. I'm not showing you how we do it, but you can say you can do it with the uh, Gabor frame matrix to the minus one. And uh, the tight Gabor family is the Gabor basis family computed uh, with A and B. And just uh, to check that the Gabor frame operator coming from this done in a completely naive way is just the identity matrix that can be done very quickly. Now, uh, what is a Gabor multiplier? Well, a Gabor multiplier describes the, the uh, uh, multiplies the contribution here. 
so I have to say, well, we have to use a weight. Now I would say is one uh, again. I will have to see if it works. Uh, zero one, yeah, and and uh, four and seven. Now what is this? Well, this is uh, a function which is supposed to be derived from a. Yeah, we'll do this new new. Uh, I want to show you this, but with a color bar. I need for my demonstration. I need a smooth function on face space, because I would like to later on look at Gabor multipliers with different sampling lattices. So, uh, oh yeah, that should be a new figure, of course, and that will give me a new uh, function. But. Uh, we will use a function which has an amplitude between one and two. So the one is because zero one uh, gives me a smooth function, which is a low pass signal. We had this at the beginning of the course uh, with some smoothness in different directions. And also here I can do this pass uh, hold with the lattice that we are using. And maybe I'm doing it here with red. I'm not sure if this works, but I think yes, should, should be okay. And you see, a Gabor multiplier would say, well, we are creating uh, the sampling values of the short time free transform at the red positions. So maybe I also uh, verify once more. You can take the STFT of our random signal with tight window at A and B, or you can say, no, I'm taking just this color product in the naive way. This is uh, this here. So now maybe I should freeze or keep this fixed. Uh, and we want to see that this is really the same. So what we are doing now here is and the lot is find uh, lum well uh, it's the lattice points n a b kind of how do i pick the value of this weight function at the red points and i would start at zero zero which is matlab one one and i would go down the first column so for each point i have to know what the sequences are what is the length of this index sequence of the lattice and of course it will be 720 you see, I have to 720, and uh, but uh, I, I want to. I need this because I want to have the weight sampled, which is weight read, reading the weight values at, in the same order as we have it for the Garber family with this. And now uh, I would say we have two ways of doing a Garber multiplier. One is a naive command which says, "Well, you're giving me." the uh and high you're giving me uh, a, a weight function you're telling me what your atom is and you want to use it on the lattice a and b that would be one command uh, the other one would be uh, to say well i'm just giving you the sampled version of the lattice and of course if you sample at the right points you would say I'm taking it in a sampling in the B, in the vertical direction with distance B and in the horizontal direction by A. So here the order is not time frequency, but rows and columns. And of course I have to say what the GT is. And so the first thing I want to show you is we can compare these two routines. So that's just two different ways of using the routine. Uh, and the first one is good if you want to compare Gabor multipliers with different lattices, but you see it's just computed in identically manner. Uh, but we can also say, no, for me, it means uh, GMW direct or so is, well, I'm taking coefficients with this, then I'm multiplying with the sampled weight function. No, I'm multiplying the values which means a multiple as an operator i'm multiplying with the diagonal matrix and then i'm doing synthesis with the tight family because in each case we were using the tight gabber window 
and now I'm comparing it. So this is really computed in a different way. And, uh, and so what we have here is comp norm of GMW and GMW direct. If we run this section, you see it's the same, but it's done in a numerically different way. Okay, and now you can say now I'm interested to see what happens uh, if if I make, uh, for example, we can compare now with the first way of looking at this, the Gabor matrix with this for, uh, I don't know, four and four uh, with, uh, sorry, that's missing, Gab multiplier according to Mario Hampais and with the Garber multiplier MH with uh, uh, W, G and 2 and 2. Now, if you think uh, of this here, if I would have done this in a direct way, I would have had n squared divided by four projection operators or projections. So that would be that the diagonal would be huge. So the direct way is good to make sure that we are doing the right thing. But here we are uh, much better off. So I'm running this. Uh, that, that's the wrong section. This one here. Uh, and there is a typo that I'm missing. And uh, yeah, okay, that, that's very interesting. Because what does it show you? That, well, lattice 4, 4 and 2, 2 are extremely uh, sparse lattices. So maybe I'm doing the same thing with 6, 6 to show you. And the interesting thing is that you see that the comp norm says we compare these two matrices in the Frobenius norm. So we compare the pixel images that we get. And uh, there's a factor coming here, and maybe I'm just doing it now with 8.8. 8. So what you see is if the lattice constants are fine, it's just a scaling factor. And now I want to explain the scaling factor. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I think that's uh, just a, I see it. that's just a typo. Yeah, so when you go from 4.4 4 to 8.8, 8, one aspect is that 8.8 8 is uh, four times more sparse. So the number of lattice points for lattice with lattice constants 4.4 4 is uh, four times as large as this one. That's why you have this. So that's why I think what you can expect by just counting, uh, or the, let's say, the energy which is in the sampled version of a short time free transformer. You would expect that there is a loss and that was actually the case when i was doing this maybe i'm doing this once more uh, uh yeah maybe i'm doing this here now uh i'm doing the one one case so one one is if you don't describe it here or here i do the four four case uh, and then you will see it's again uh a factor of four no it's 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 uh, let, let me take it out for it. that's no not nothing sorry and that's a typo yeah now you see the redundancy that you have of the lattice with one one compared to the one with four four is four times four in each direction and four times four is 16. so this is why you expect this factor but otherwise, the lattice with four is already giving you something which is practically the same. And uh, if you test this in more interesting cases, you find out this is true because our original profile, this is flat and doesn't change so much. And if it would be perfectly constant, you could take uh, even the, the 20 and 16 because our atom has been uh, would be adapted or so. so. But let's let's look at uh, take uh, this into account. And so here, for going already from 4 to 8 in a symmetric way, you see the error is going from numerical precision to 10 to the minus 5. So it's, yeah, it's visible, but not, not really harmless. And I have done here, uh, 
already this compensation of the density with the factor of four. So this is telling you a lot about the Gabor multipliers. And uh, so what I will uh, discuss next time is uh, how to build these Gabor multipliers and also how to create these discrete uh, Gauss fun uh, discrete Hermit functions and how to use them. So maybe this would be could be the content of the first lesson. And uh, the point is that the garb, maybe I should mention this here, we have seen this compatibility. If we are moving our atom around, then you have uh, in the Kornirnberg symbol such a position. Now, the viewpoint that you should take is that the Gaber multiplier is uh, really a linear combination of projection operators. And each of those project projections is corresponding to the, you would say, the position of the slider of the audio engineer at the time. So the amplitude says now here there is some emphasis or not. And so uh, the best approximation of a given matrix by a Gaber multiplier is better interpreted if you say now you have this collection of bump functions, it's like a beast plan. How can I approximate a given image, namely the Kornirnberg symbol of my operator, by a collection of bump functions? So if you have an underspread operator, which means that you have something which is concentrated here, not, not a circular, but concentrated here, that would mean your Kornirnberg symbol would be smooth. And that's why a, a underspread operator which is not smearing around too much, uh, can be very, very well approximated or even be represented by a Gaber multiplier. So this is uh, quite important. If you think of audio engineer, you would like to do a time variant filter, uh, but not changing too abruptly, but you can do it in a digital way using these Gaber multipliers sitting on the lattice. And so I think it's a good point to a stop and this very long, very long uh, presentation today. I'm sorry. Maybe I should have done a break in between, but now I have to see how to stop the recording. Um, stop the sharing now, and then I can stop the recording.